Thank you and good evening. First of all, I want to thank you for your presence. And uh, I think this is going to be, I know this is going to be a wonderful evening for each one of us. We are honored to have with us tonight one of the preeminent Catholic theologians and authors of our time. That is no exaggeration. That is not hyperbole. Mr. George Weigel is the distinguished senior fellow and titular of the William E. Simon Chair in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. He's a native of Baltimore. He was educated at St. Mary's Seminary College there and at the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. Mr. Weigel is perhaps best known for his two major biographies of blessed Pope John Paul II. The first, Witness to Hope, the biography of Pope John Paul II, and the other book is entitled, The End and the Beginning, Pope John Paul II, The Victory of Freedom, The Last Years, and The Legacy. Mr. Weigel spent 15 years on writing those two works. But during that time, he wrote other books, essays, op-ed columns, and reviews for the major opinion journals in the United States. He is an enormously prolific writer. Much of his work has focused on the role of the Catholic Church in our increasingly secularized society. Mr. Weigel has written or edited more than 20 books alone. They include The Truth of Catholicism, The Courage to be Catholic, Letters to a Young Catholic, and The Cube and the Cathedral, Europe, America, and Politics Without God. Mr. Weigel's weekly column, The Catholic Difference, examines the church in modern society and is syndicated to 60 newspapers in the United States. He is a frequent guest on television and radio and is the Vatican analyst for NBC News. He has been awarded 13 honorary doctorates and spoken at many, many, many more commencements than that. He was also decorated by the Holy Father with the Papal Cross Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice for his work. He was also, for, and also from the Republic of Poland, Mr. Weigel received the Gloria Artis Gold Medal. He serves on the boards of several organizations dedicated to human rights and religious freedom and is a member of the editorial board of the prestigious journal First Things. He speaks to approximately 100 groups a year, and we are certainly privileged to have him with us tonight. You can see, as I say so often, when you're good, everybody wants you. Well, we're just delighted to have Mr. Weigel with us this evening because we know the competition uh, is quite formidable to have him come and speak, so we're privileged and honored. And besides what I mentioned, speaking to 100 groups a year, he also teaches a course on Catholic social doctrine every summer in Krakow, Poland. And I'm happy to tell you that earlier today at noon, he was the keynote speaker at our annual Red Mass. And uh, it was an excellent talk. And I know that uh, you're interested to hear him, so Without further words of introduction on my part, it is now my privilege to give you Mr. George Weigel. Thank you, Bishop Brandt, for that extravagantly gracious introduction such adulatory overkill uh, often puts me in mind of President Lyndon Johnson, 
who, when similarly extolled at a public event, would begin by thanking whoever introduced him and saying, I'm just sorry that my uh, mammy and my pappy couldn't be here to hear it because my pappy would have enjoyed it and my mammy would have believed it. <laughs> In these past five or six years, dominated throughout the world by a financial and economic crisis of quite striking proportions, the phrase, the handwriting on the wall, has been a staple of the public conversation, a kind of shorthand metaphor for the generalized sense of disorientation, unease, fear for the future that seems epidemic throughout the Western world and which is having an obvious effect on our national cast of mind in this election year. We hear that phrase, the handwriting on the wall, all the time, but I wonder how many of those who invoke it have looked closely at its source, which is the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. The story that is told there is a very striking one, and recalling it in full might help us come to grips with whatever is being written on the walls of this moment in our national history and in the history of Western civilization. Reflecting on that story might also help us identify a prophet who, like Daniel, could help us translate the handwriting on the wall, understand its meaning, and thus know our duty. The scene is readily set. The place is Babylon, the time some two and a half millennia ago in the sixth century BC. The kingdom of Judah has been conquered by the Chaldean king Nebuchadnezzar, who the book of Daniel tells us ordered his chief minister to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, handsome and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, competent to serve in the king's palace, and to teach them the letters and language of the Chaldeans. The most impressive of this group of talented young Jews was named Daniel. In addition to the personal qualities specified by Nebuchadnezzar for royal service, Daniel had the unique power to interpret the great king's dreams, a skill that led Nebuchadnezzar to acknowledge, for one moment at least, that Daniel's God, the God of the people of Israel, was, as the second chapter of Daniel quotes Nebuchadnezzar, God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, was a different matter, however. Here is the book of Daniel, chapter 5. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, be brought, so that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the gold and silver vessels which had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Now that was, as you can imagine, an unwelcome interruption of the royal party. 
Belshazzar was terrified and promised to make the man who could decipher the writing and its meaning the third ruler in the kingdom. The tenured academics and Babylonian op-ed writers, the talking heads of the local television, were stumped. Then the queen had an idea, call in Daniel. So the king summoned the young Jewish exile and promised him the third position in the kingdom if he could read the handwriting on the wall and explain its meaning. <clears throat> the book of Daniel tells the rest of the story. Then Daniel answered before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. You have lifted yourself up above the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. <coughs> Excuse me. And you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this was the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar commanded and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put about his neck and proclamation was made concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Belshazzar's feast and its ending in the king's abrupt death is a kind of biblical warning against the lethal effects, the deadly effects of blasphemy. And what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is the worship of that which is not worthy of worship, which is in fact the negation of worship. In his drunken arrogance, Belshazzar turned sacred vessels intended for true worship into playthings for debauchery. And because of that negation of worship, his claim to sovereignty was annulled. The handwriting on the wall spoke of this, and it spoke truly. Is there similar handwriting on the wall in our own time? I think there is. The words are different. They tend to be written not telegraphically on walls by mysterious fingers, but voluminously in newspapers and magazines and books and scholarly journals and online websites. But these words also tell the results of the negation of worship. Or to put the matter less dramatically and less biblically, the words on the wall at this moment in history speak of a kind of negation, a deconstruction, an abandonment of the deep truths on which the civilization of the Western world has been built. Or to put the matter bluntly, one of the things the handwriting on the wall in the early 21st century is telling us is that the secular project is over. By secular project, I mean the effort extending over the past two centuries to erect an empty shrine at the heart of political modernity. This project's symbolic beginning may be dated precisely to April 2nd, 1791, when the French National Constituent Assembly ordered the noble Parisian Church of St. Genevieve to be transformed into a secular mausoleum, the Pantheon. The secular project accelerated throughout the 19th century as the high culture of Europe was shaped by what 
the great 20th century French theologian Henri de Lubac called atheistic humanism. The claim that the God of the Bible was the enemy of human maturity, who must therefore be rejected in the name of human liberation. After this atheistic humanism had produced, among other things, two world wars and the greatest slaughters in recorded history, a softer form of the empty shrine project emerged in the 20th century. This softer secularism focused on the institutional structures and processes of democracy in the market. If you simply got those structures right, political powers separated and balanced, markets designed for maximum efficiency, then all you had to do was insert the key in the ignition and let the machinery of politics and economics run by themselves. In both its brutal hard form and its softer form, this secular project has been proven wrong. For it ignored a deep truth, a truth that we often sense but find it difficult to articulate. It's the truth that Alexis de Tocqueville understood about America over 150 years ago, that it takes a certain kind of people living certain virtues to make democracy and the free economy work properly. Those kind of people don't just happen. They must be formed in the habits of heart and mind, the virtues that enable them, that enable us, to guide the machinery of free politics and free economics so that the, the net outcome is the promotion of the human good. And there is no such formation in the virtues of freedom available at the empty shrine. A glimpse of what the empty shrine does produce was on offer a year ago this past summer in Great Britain, when packs of feral young people rampaged through city after city in an orgy of self-indulgence threat and destruction, theft and destruction. The truth of what all that was about was most powerfully articulated by Lord Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of Britain, writing in the Wall Street Journal. Rabbi Sachs wrote, this was the bursting of a dam of potential trouble that had been building for years. The collapse of families and communities leaves in its wake unsocialized young people who are the products of a tsunami of wishful thinking that washed across the West, saying that you can have sex without responsibility of marriage, children without the responsibility of parenthood, social order without the responsibility of citizenship, liberty without the responsibility of morality, and self-esteem without the responsibility of work and earned achievement. The inability of democratic countries in recent years to make rational decisions in the face of impending fiscal disaster gives us another glimpse into the effects of the empty shrine and its inability to form men and women of democratic virtue citizens capable of moral and economic responsibility in both their personal and public lives. Whether the venue is Athens, Greece, or Madison, Wisconsin, the Piazza Venezia in Rome, or McPherson Square in Washington, the underlying moral problem is the same. Adults who have internalized a sense of entitlement that is wholly disconnected from a sense of responsibility. And once again, it was Rabbi Sachs who connected the dots here when he wrote that the moral meltdown of the West, the attempt to build a civilization disconnected from the deep truths on which it was founded, had had inevitable economic and financial outcomes. Lord Sachs wrote, what has happened morally in the West has happened financially as well. 
as people were persuaded that you could spend more than you earn, incur debt at unprecedented levels, and consume the world's resources without thinking about who will pay the bill and when. These linked phenomena, spending our moral capital with the same reckless abandon that we have been spending our financial capital, are, Rabbi Sachs concluded, the inevitable result of what he called a culture of the free lunch in a world in which there are no free lunches. At the moment, the gravest examples of the moral cultural disease that is eating away at the vital organs of Western democracy may be found in places like Greece and Italy. Their public irrationality and political irresponsibility have rendered the dem democratic system so dysfunctional that under the pressure of the sovereign debt crisis, the normal processes of democratic governance have been suspended and ruled by technocratic elites operating beneath a thin democratic veneer has been installed by the European Union. But Americans would be foolish, I think, if we don't see glimpses of the effects of the empty shrine in our own country. <clears throat> Those results come into view when we note the distinct absence of profiles and courage in our own politics when entry into public service is essentially a projection of personal ego and self-esteem, when the crude exchange of epithets displaces serious engagement with issues, when complexities are reduced to sound bites because the talk radio show must go on, when short-term political risk aversion leads to grave long-term consequences, when transgenerational solidarity is abandoned in the name of immediate gratification when the question becomes, what can I get out of the state and its treasury, not what am I contributing to the common good? What these symptoms of democratic dysfunction suggest is that this empty shrine of the secularist project is not, in fact, entirely empty. For while it's true that the atheistic humanism of the 19th century and the democratic functionalism and economic libertarianism of the 20th century have drained a lot of moral energy from both free politics and free economics, the shrine at the heart of Western civilization has become the temple of a new form of worship, the worship of the imperial autonomous self which in 1992, three justices of the US Supreme Court promoted and celebrated as, quote, the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. That false worship of the self, the worship of that which is not worthy of worship, has led to a severe weakening of the moral sinews of our democratic culture. The commitment to reason and truth-telling in debate, the courage to face hard facts swirly, the willingness to concede that others might have something to teach us, the ability to distinguish between prudent compromise and the abandonment of principle, and the very idea of the common good which might demand personal sacrifice. If the handwriting on the wall is telling us that the secular project is over, then one of the lessons of that verdict can be put like this. While there are undoubtedly serious functional problems with Western institutions of governance in the early 21st century, Washington is broken, as we often hear. The greatest deficit from which our country and other democracies suffer today is a deficit of democratic culture. And the primary cause of that deficit has been the profligate spending out of the moral cultural capital built up in the West under the influence of biblical religion. 
What we call the West and the distinctive forms of political and economic life it's generated didn't just happen. Those distinctive forms of politics and economics, democracy and the market are not solely the product of the European Enlightenment. The deeper taproots of our civilization lie in cultural soil nurtured by the fruitful interaction of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. Biblical religion, from which the West learned the idea of history as a purposeful journey into the future, not just one damn thing after another. Greek rationality, which taught the West that there are truths embedded in the world and in us, and that we can have access to those truths through reason, and Roman jurisprudence, which taught the West the superiority of the rule of law over the rule of brute force and sheer coercion. These three pillars of the West, Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome, are all essential, and they reinforce each other in a complex cultural synthesis. That mutual interdependence of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome biblical religion, faith and reason, rule of law, is another lesson that the handwriting on the wall in the early 20th century is teaching us. If, for example, you throw the God of the Bible over the side, as atheistic humanism demanded, you get two severe problems, one empirical, the other a matter of cultural temperament. Empirically, it seems obvious now that when the God of the Bible is abandoned in the name of human maturation and liberation, so is the God of the Bible's first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. And then one embarks on the kind of demographic winter that is central to the crisis of the European welfare state, which is fundamentally a reflection of the fact that no country in the European Union today has a replacement level birth rate, and most of them have not had a replacement level birth rate for generations. The second effect of the abandonment of the God of the Bible is cultural. One begins to lose faith in reason. For when reason is detached from belief in the God of the Bible who imprinted his divine reason on the world, reason soon turns in on itself. Then radical skepticism about the human capacity to know the truth of anything with clarity begets various soured forms of nihilism. And that lethal cocktail of skepticism and nihilism, as Benedict XVI reminds us, in turn yields moral relativism and the deterioration of the rule of law as relativism is imposed on all of society by coercive state power. CF, HHS contraception mandate of this past January. Colgate University's Robert Cranach has neatly described the net result of all this as freeloading atheism. Like King Belshazzar's lords, wives, and concubines, those formed by the empty shrine and the worship of the self have been drinking profligately out of sacred vessels, freeloading on moral truths that they do not acknowledge and in many cases hold in contempt, but which are essential for sustaining democracy and the free economy, which the freeloaders claim to honor. But as Rabbi Lord Sachs pointed out 15 months ago, that jig is up. If the death of the secular project is one truth <clears throat> that the handwriting on the wall is teaching in our time, then so is the related truth of that phenomenon of contemporary intellectual knife, no, life known as postmodernism, which has been done in by a radical disconnect between narrative and reality. In recent years, the notion of narrative, which gave birth to that truly horrible neologism, narrativizing, 
<coughs> has become ubiquitous in our public vocabulary. Listen to the news or the talking heads any night. To change the narrative is to gain political advantage. To narrativize a problem in a new way is, to be, is, to, is thought to have solved it. Yet changing the narrative can't change reality. And anchoring our public life to narrative rather than reality can so warp our perceptions of reality that we end up like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, teaching ourselves impossible things before breakfast and lunch and dinner. This has become painfully obvious in Europe where the public narrative of the post-World uh, post War II period, and particularly of the post-Cold War period, is the story of the creation of a community of social democracies living in harmony in a world beyond conflict. That narcotic and seductive narrative has crashed against reality in recent years and most painfully in the past 18 months. It has crashed against the consequences of an unprecedented phenomenon in human history, systematic depopulation on a mass scale through deliberate and self-induced infertility. That infertility in turn set the stage for the contemporary European fiscal crisis and the crisis of the modern European welfare state. For the simple fact, the reality that no narrative can change is that Europe does not have a sufficient number of taxpaying workers to sustain the social welfare states it has created. And as if that were not bad enough, the post-Cold War European narrative has also crashed into the reality of spoiled and self-indulgent citizens whose productivity cannot deliver the standard of living their politicians promise. Those promises being yet another example of false narratives. And then there is the damage that substituting narrative for reality has done in our own country. To the Obama administration, to the general health of the public discourse, and to our national security. Evidently, the administration was so taken with the results of the narrativizing that worked wonders during the 2008 campaign that it imagined that narrative is the very point of government. As the president himself put it a few months ago in an interview with Emmett Miller of Black Entertainment Network reflecting on what he might have done differently, the more you're in this office, the more you have to say to yourself that telling a story to the American people is just as important as the actual policies you're implementing. As one of my colleagues in Washington noted in commenting on this remarkable glimpse into the president's understanding of his job, presidents certainly must take seriously what the first President Bush dismissed, likely to his regret, as the vision thing. But for a president to argue that what fundamentally matters in governance is storytelling, is at the very least a striking indicator of just how much President Obama is influenced by the intellectual exhaust fumes of postmodernism and this ubiquitous concept of narrative equals reality. The difficulty, of course, is that ideas, even bad ideas, have consequences. The consequences of this commitment to narrative in the administration have certainly falsified domestic reality and made serious problem solving more difficult. They have also, in my judgment, placed the world and the nation in greater potential jeopardy. A change of narrative cannot change reality, but false narratives can so warp our perceptions of reality that matters become worse. And matters that become worse can and often do lead to matters becoming more dangerous. 
That too is part of the handwriting on the wall in this election year. In the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel, the handwriting on the wall spoke, however cryptically, of the imminent demise of King Belshazzar's regime. I'm not suggesting tonight that the handwriting on the wall in the early 21st century bespeaks the demise of the West or of the United States. Like Rabbi Sachs in his Wall Street Journal article, I too can look back on moments of social dissolution, followed by rapid periods of cultural transformation and profound societal change. In that Wall Street Journal article, Jonathan Sachs cited the rapid change of early industrial England under the influence of the Methodist Revolution, which in two generations transformed British society in positive ways. Closer to our own time, we might recall the transformation of American culture, society, and law affected by the classic civil rights movement, another revolution of social change led by churchmen and built on the foundations of biblical faith. Any such revolution in the 21st century, however, will have to contend with social acids at least as destructive as cheap gin in the London of Charles Dickens and entrenched racism in America. It will have to contend with the intellectual rubbish of the past two centuries, which has placed the imperial autonomous self at the center of Western civilization while reducing democracy and the free economy to matters of mechanics. Who is the Daniel who can read this handwriting on the wall and point a path not to the demise of democracy, but to its moral and cultural renewal and thus its political transformation? Let me suggest one possible, if surprising, candidate for that prophetic role namely the Bishop of Rome who created the modern papacy, Pope Leo XIII. Born in 1810 into the minor Italian nobility and elected Pope in 1878 as a caretaker, he died in 1903 after what was then the second longest recorded pontificate in recorded history. Vincenzo Gioacchino Pecci came to the papacy at one of the lowest points in that ancient office's historic fortunes. On the demise of the papal states in 1870 and the pope's withdrawal from public view as the prisoner of the Vatican, the great and the good of Europe thought the papacy and the church were a spent force in terms of world history. Yet over the next 25 years, Leo XIII would prove to statesmen that he was the wiliest pope in centuries. More to the point for our purposes, Leo XIII was also possessed by a relentless determination to diagnose the contingencies of his historical moment in the light of philosophical and theological first principles. He was in that sense a kind of what we call today a public intellectual. Like his papal successors, he too believed in reading the signs of the times. But unlike the radical secularists of his time and ours, Leo XIII believed in reading the signs of the time through lenses ground by faith and reason. His passion for understanding the deep currents of history through reason informed by a biblical vision of the human person is best remembered today for having launched the social doctrine of the Catholic Church with the 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum. Yet Leo, who began to disentangle the church in Europe from the evangelically stifling embrace of the old regimes, was also an acute analyst of the pathologies of political modernity. And it's that aspect of his thought and teaching 
that makes him a possible Daniel for our time, helping us read the handwriting on the wall as the freeloading pagans of our time continue their carousing. Leo's analysis of political modernity might be summed up in one phrase. No telos, no justice. Or if you prefer, no metaphysics, no morals. Or to leave the technical vocabulary of philosophy, no grounding of politics and economics in the deep truths of the human condition, no society fit for human beings. <clears throat> what I have called the empty shrine at the center of political modernity was for Leo XIII, the result of a dramatic revolution in European intellectual life in which metaphysics, once thought to be the highest of philosophical disciplines, had been displaced from the center of reflection. Thinking about thinking had replaced thinking about truth, and governance had therefore come unstuck from the first principles of justice. Science, which had replaced metaphysics as the most consequential of intellectual disciplines, could provide no answer to the moral question with which all politics in the Western tradition begins. How ought we to live together? Worse, when science stepped outside its disciplinary boundaries and tried its hand at social and political prescription, it let loose new demons, such as social Darwinism, that would prove astonishingly lethal when they shaped the national tempers that made the great slaughters of the First World War possible. <clears throat> Pope Leo tried to fill the empty shrine at the heart of modern politics with reason and with the moral truths that reason can discern. This was, to be sure, reason informed by biblical faith and Christian doctrine. <clears throat> but the genius of Leo XIII was that he found a vocabulary to address the social and political and economic problems of his time and ours that was genuinely ecumenical and accessible to everyone. The vocabulary of public reason drawn from the natural moral law that is embedded in the world and in us. In one of his great encyclicals on political modernity, Leo wrote, the best parent and guardian of liberty amongst men is truth. Unlike the postmodern Pontius Pilots, who imagine that the cynical question, what is truth, ends the argument, Leo XIII understood that that question, which can be asked in a non-cynical and genuinely inquiring way, is the beginning of any serious wrestling with the further question, how ought we to live together? This general orientation to the problem of modern politics then led Pope Leo to pose a cultural challenge to the modern political life of the West, a challenge to think more deeply about law, about the nature of freedom, about civil society, and its relationship to the state, and about the limits of state power. <coughs> Excuse me. Leo's concept of law, <clears throat> drawn from Thomas Aquinas, challenged the legal positivism of his time and ours, according to which the law is what the law says it is, period. That may be true at a very crude level. But such a view, which is also shaped by the modern tendency to see civil laws as analogous to the laws of nature, empties law of moral content, detaches it from reason, and treats it as a mere expression of human willfulness. Leo challenged political uh, modernity to a nobler concept of law as a precept binding on us by reason promulgated by a competent authority for the common good. Thus, law is not mere coercion. Law is authoritative prescription grounded in reason. True law, just law, reflects moral judgment 
and its power comes from its moral persuasiveness. Law appeals to conscience, not just to fear. Given this understanding of law, it should come as no surprise that Leo challenged modern politics to a nobler concept of freedom. Following Aquinas, Leo XIII insisted that freedom is not sheer willfulness. The notion of freedom defined by that eminent moral philosopher Frank Sinatra as I did it my way. Rather, as Leo XIII's successor John Paul II would put it, freedom is the human capacity to know what is truly good, to choose it freely, and to do so as a matter of habit or virtue. Here, in this understanding, a talent for freedom grows in us. And we cut short that learning process if we insist that my freedom consists in doing what I want to do now. Leo's challenge to modern politics was also a challenge to the notion of the omnicompetent state. Leo XIII was a committed defender of what we would call civil society, or what were called in his day voluntary private associations. Political community, according to Leo XIII, was built out from a richly textured pluralism of associations of which the state was but one, although an important one. These voluntarily entered free associations, which included everything from the family through business and labor associations to civic groups and religious communities. These voluntarily entered free associations were not just barriers against the reach of state power, they were goods in themselves because they expressed different forms of friendship and human solidarity. Thus, the just state would take care to protect those free associations which contributed to the common good in unique ways, not least by forming the habits of heart and mind that made willful men and women into good citizens. Moreover, Pope Leo proposed the state's responsibility to provide legal protection for the functioning of free and voluntary associations is not something that the state simply concedes out of a sense of generosity or governmental noblesse oblige. That responsibility to protect the institutions of, of civil society was a matter of first principles. In this case, the principle of the limited law governed state. For the state that can recognize that there are human associations that exist prior to the state, not just as a matter of historical chronology, but as a matter of the deep truths of the human condition, is a state that has recognized the boundary markers of its own competence and thus the limits of its legitimate reach. And if you hear in that description of Leo XIII, a papal warning about what is now upon us in the arguments over the nature and character of marriage and over the right of the church to order its own life according to its self-understanding, you have heard Pope Leo accurately. In that first papal encyclical, Rerum Novarum, Leo XIII wrote with remarkable insight about many of the debates of our own time, including arguments about the nature of religious freedom, the regulatory powers of the US Department of Health and Human Services, the reach of the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, and as I mentioned, the definition of marriage. The specific form of voluntary association that was addressed in Rerum Novarum was the trade union but the principle Pope Leo articulated applies throughout the rich associational matrix of civil society, where Leo wrote, the state should watch over these societies of citizens banded together in accordance with their rights, but the state should not thrust itself into their particular concerns in their organization, 
for things move and live by the spirit inspiring them and may be killed by the rough grasp of a hand from without. In 2012, the American people confront many con questions in what seems likely to be a defining national election, not unlike 1800, 1828, 1860, 1932, and 1980 in its potential consequences. Will the United States continue to lead from behind in world affairs, or will it resume its place as the indispensable country at the point in confronting threats to world order? Will the United States follow the social model pioneered by world, uh, post-World War II Western Europe, or will we devise new ways of combining compassion, justice, personal responsibility, and public fiscal discipline? Can the challenges of globalization be met in ways that expand, not diminish, the middle class? Will the federal judiciary continue to provide legal support for the doomed secular project, or will it permit the normal mechanisms of democratic self-governance to advance a nobler understanding of freedom and indeed of law itself? Will religious freedom remain the first liberty of these United States, or will religious communities be pushed farther to the margins of public life? Will the legal architecture of America promote a culture of life or a culture of death? These are all questions of grave import. On first glance, they can appear like a broken kaleidoscope that never resolves itself into discernible patterns and connections. Or to return to the image with which I began, the handwriting on the wall can seem indecipherable. Yet with Pope Leo XIII's acute analysis of political modernity as our guide, perhaps we can decipher the writing and, discerning, and discern its meaning. Handwriting on the wall at this moment in history is telling us that a political culture detached from the deep moral truths embedded in the human condition eventually yields traits of selfishness and irresponsibility that ill befit the citizens of a democracy. The handwriting on the wall is telling us that a democratic politics that ignores those deep truths eventually dissolves into thinly disguised dictatorship, what Pope Benedict has called the dictatorship of relativism. And if that is the message, then our duty comes into clearer focus too. If the rule of law, the heritage of Rome, is threatened among us, not just by rioting British youth, violent protest, and unfocused fear, but by the transfer of the transformation of law into coercion in the name of misguided compassion, then we should look to Jerusalem and Athens, to a revival of the biblical image of the human person, and to a rediscovery of the art of reason as the means by which to rebuild the foundations of democracy. In Psalm 11, the biblical poet asks what those who care for justice are to do if the foundations are destroyed. The beginning of an answer to that poignant question, I suggest, is to disentangle ourselves from the notion that the ratchet of history works in only one direction. Then, having regained a sense of possibility about the present, and a sense of purposefulness about the future, we can proceed on the basis of biblical faith and on the basis of the reason that God built into the human condition to rebuild the foundations of political culture of our country and the West through a deepening of that biblical faith and a reassertion of the prerogatives of reason in the name of a nobler concept of law-governed democracy and of human freedom. Thank you.